The annual Helen Keller Lecture at Troy University conceived to promote people who excel in their chosen field despite extraordinary physical or mental challenges was held Tuesday, March 1st in the Claudia Crosby Theater on the Troy campus. The lecture is sponsored by Troy University, the Helen Keller Foundation for Research and Education, the Alabama State Department of Education, the Alabama State Department of Rehabilitation Services, the Alabama Department of Mental Health, and the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind. The guest speaker at this 21st annual lecture is acclaimed jazz pianist and one of the world's most prominent jazz musicians, Marcus Roberts. The lecture is introduced by Troy Dean of Education, Dr. Katherine Hildebrand. The Helen Keller Lecture at Troy University is designed to promote awareness of those individuals who excel in their chosen fields despite physical or mental challenges. Troy University is fortunate to have, have the support of several important agencies and organizations that make this lecture and other events possible. Our partners this year are the Helen Keller Foundation for Research and Education, the Alabama Department of Education, the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services, the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind, and st the student chapters of the National Association for Music Education, Phi Mu Alpha, Sigma Alpha Iota, Kappa Kappa Psi, Tau Beta Sigma, and Phi Buddha Ruta, and a faculty donor. In 2008, Troy initiated the state's first Bachelor of Science degree in interpreter training to help fill a need created by a lack of qualified interpreters in Alabama. This fall, we had approximately 250 students enrolled in the program. Graduates from our interpreter training program are helping to fill a vital need for certified interpreters throughout the state of Alabama and beyond. I would like to thank our interpreter for today's lecture, Stacy Yarborough, sponsored by the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. I also want to thank my colleague, Ms. Judy Robertson, and members of the steering committee for their work in planning this year's event. As you entered the theater today, you certainly noticed the artwork on display. These pieces were the work of students at the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and Blind, and we are grateful for the work of our students. We are grateful for our partners for sharing this wonderful work with us today. The names of our featured artists can be found inside your program. Now it is my honor to introduce a gentleman who has led Troy University throughout an era of unprecedented growth. This lecture series is just one example of the many initiatives Dr. Jack Hawkins, Jr. has <coughs> introduced since becoming Chancellor of Troy University in 1989. Dr. Hawkins has been instrumental in the effort to internationalize Troy University in order to prepare our students to compete on a global stage. His student-first philosophy and commitment to maintaining high academic standards for the benefit of our students has left a permanent imprint on our institution. It is my honor to present the Chancellor of Troy University, Dr. Jack Hopkins, Jr. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hildebrand, and good morning to each of you. What a an honor it is to uh, share this time with you, a, a time that uh, literally has become one of the, the very special traditions of this institution. And so many good things have happened as a result of uh, this experience for all of us over these last 21 years. I, I hasten to say that uh, my wife had the idea. Sometimes I get credit for the idea, but I didn't have the idea. She had the idea, and I think this is the first uh, lecture that she's missed, uh, and I hate to tell you that she's not here, but we have a three-month-old granddaughter who needed her today, <laughs> and so uh, she's here in spirit and, and will be with us tonight, but uh, please uh, bear with me as, as we go through this day without her. I, I always miss her because this is a very special part uh, of her heart. 
And I want to uh, join Dr. Hildebrand in echoing uh, our appreciation for the uh, Alabama School for the Blind Ensemble and to thank uh, Mr. Chad Bell for the direction and great direction that he, that he offers those uh, very talented young people. We have uh, all of you are special. We have some honored guests here this morning that I'd like to introduce. And as I do so, I'll just ask that they stand and remain standing and then we can uh, recognize all as a group uh, so that we can get to the next part of the program that uh, I think is a real treat. But we are very proud to be an all Steinway University, one of only 175 in the world uh, today. And that occurred within the last six months. Uh, and when we were fortunate to be able to bring 28 of the world's finest pianos to this campus, this being but one. And uh, it puts uh, this university and our school for uh, School of Music, the John uh, Long School of Music, in a very, very special position. We have a, an all style or a Steinway, Steinway artist in Dr. Wee Ting Young. And the gentleman who you'll hear in just a bit is also a Steinway artist, and so they have so much in common. But let me introduce you to three members of the, uh, the Steinway team that, uh, that who have joined us this morning. Mr. Brandon Herringbrook, please stand. Uh, Mr. John McLaren and Mr. Kevin McLaren, we would say uh, welcome uh, to you and thank you for all that you've done to help us get to this point. Thank you. We have agencies that, uh, that have come together to make this happen over the last 21 years and some wonderful things have happened as a result of the dialogue that always occurs. Uh, Dr. Hildebrand mentioned the, uh, our interpreter training program, which is the only one in the state of Alabama, but it literally was produced as a result of the conversations that we've been able to have with agency heads. We have a, a graduate program in rehabilitation counseling that literally was born as a result of the dialogue. And so good things happen when good people come together and they're not concerned who gets the credit. They're only attempting to address needs. And that's why we value so much the relationship that we share with these agencies. And let me ask these uh, representatives to stand. Again, hold your applause. Alabama Department of Mental Health, the commissioner, Mr. Jim Perdue, and Ms. Charlene Crump, the Helen Keller Foundation, uh, Ms. Keller Johnson. And Keller, thank you. Please stand up and, and remain standing. Uh, the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind, and we certainly appreciate the delegation uh, with us today. Dr. Nancy Mascia. Uh, Nancy is here, uh, the better part of the John and Nancy team. John is in Washington doing what sometimes we all do and begging money, but I know he'll be successful. Tell him we missed him. Uh, Dr. Ben Bruce. Dr. Dennis Gilliam, Ms. Shirley Hamer, Ms. Lynn Hanner, uh, Ms. Vera Hendricks, and Mr. Jerry Martin. The Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services, Mr. Curtis Gleason, Ms. Dana Barber, Ms. Bader Mr. Badarius Bell, and Mr. Ashley Townsend. Uh, the brother of our speaker and, and the Steinway artist, Mr. Eugene Roberts, we are very, very pleased, too, that a member of our Board of Trustees uh, and the Chairman of our Foundation Board of Directors, Ms. Karen Carter, is with us. Uh, and I would like all of you to join me in saying thank you to all these folks for coming today. Thank you. This lecture series truly does celebrate the spirit of a great Alabamian I think perhaps uh, among the most, uh, the best known, and certainly among the most influential ever to live in the state of Alabama, and that was Miss Helen Keller. She inspired the world by overcoming great odds to become the world's foremost champion of those with special needs. Past lecturers have included some remarkable people. Mr. Eric Weinmeyer, who was the very first blind man to reached the summit of Mount Everest, and I think he has now climbed all the world's greatest mountains. Uh, what a remarkable feat that has been. Miss Heather Whitestone, the first deaf Miss America. 
the actress Patty Duke, who portrayed Miss Keller on stage and screen, and of course our own Dr. John Mascio with the Alabama Institute for Deaf and Blind. Our special guest this morning, our speaker, continues the tradition of inspirational speakers that we have enjoyed over these two decades. Mr. Marcus Roberts lost his sight at age five, but he never lost his vision. In fact, his vision of becoming a world-class musician has been realized, and he continues to build on the successes he has enjoyed. Marcus is a native of Jacksonville, Florida. He was educated at the Florida School for Deaf and Blind and then later at Florida State University. And that was before he embarked on a career as a professional musician. He began his career at age 21, touring with Wynton Marsalis. And at age 27, he formed his own jazz band and has been recording and touring the world ever since. He has recorded 15 albums, with eight of them reaching the top 10 on the Billboard jazz charts. Marcus is an international ambassador of jazz and classical music, recording and performing with the Berlin Philharmonic and the New, York, New Japan Philharmonic and many other world-renowned or orchestras. He's an acclaimed composer who has written works for the Lincoln Center and for the Chamber Music America. He was profiled in a piece for the popular TV news magazine, 60 Minutes, in a segment titled The Virtuoso. He has received many, many awards, including an honorary doctorate from the Juilliard School. But he says that the one that the award that means the most to him is the Helen Keller Award for Personal Achievement that was presented by the American Foundation for the Blind. And I would be quick to point out that we have been close friends with the American Foundation for the Blind for many, many years, and in fact, its retiring president was indeed a Helen Keller lecturer quite a number of years ago. At this time, it's really an honor for me to introduce to you a gentleman who is one of the world's greatest musicians. Mr. Marcus Roberts. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank Dr. Hawkins, Larry Blocker, the members of the Helen Keller Committee and the Alabama stakeholders who helped sponsor this event along with student organizations from the Troy University School of Music um, for inviting me here. I'm deeply honored to be a part of this. This lecture series is very distinguished. Many, many great people have come and spoken before me, so the bar is quite high. Um, one of the things I want to say from the outset is when you have a disability, we often fall for the term dis, okay? And it gives us a sense of fear and uncertainty. And that is the first thing you feel when you wake up or gradually end up in a situation where one of the main five senses doesn't work. Because believe me, it's tough if they all do work. So when you're in that situation, there are two big problems. One, what am I going to do about it? What can I do to get over this hurdle? But two, how are other people going to deal with you? And what types of phobias and stereotypes are you going to fall into based strictly on the disability, which will always, unfortunately, in a lot of cases, overshadow what you're actually able to do to defeat it? And that's typically because when people see a disability or confront one, they're filled with fear and uncertainty that has less to do with you than their own fear of, well, what would I do if I woke up in this situation? So that's why you typically don't see achievement by people with disabilities being celebrated in the mainstream uh, media, unfortunately. So one of the great things about this lecture series is it, it gives us a few moments where we can actually celebrate and try to inspire 
through the acknowledgement of what these adversities represent. We have a few moments to think about those things and come together and acknowledge them and perhaps find a way to get more deserved attention to the people who symbolize and give hope to the people who are just regular folks who want regular lives and they want regular opportunities to participate in the culture. And there was a great piano teacher named Heinrich Neuhaus who uh, he taught Zviatoslav Richter, who is my favorite classical pianist, and he taught Emil Gillel's really just fantastic pianist. And he said, I am convinced that a dialectically designed method in school must encompass all degrees of talent. From the musically deficient, since such too must study music, for music is a vehicle of culture, just as any other, to the natural genius. If methodological thinking is concentrated on a small segment of reality, the average, then it is defective. It is impaired, undialectic, and consequently not valid. Now the important thing about that is, so he's saying everybody should be allowed to participate in music, irrespective of talent level. And if we think about the disabled community, that's been our struggle from birth, is A, to have access to education and the tools necessary to pursue one's dreams. Two, to be included in our culture and not cast aside and forgotten or looked upon as victims. Um, this is a very, very, very important uh, fact of our situation. And so if we follow uh, Neuhaus's, his, his premise, then it means that everyone should be included. And I think ultimately that's probably what subconsciously attracted me uh, to jazz music and becoming a jazz pianist because jazz music, it, it's about inclusion. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the people who created jazz music initially were probably two generations out of slavery. So it's not like they were part of the free society that the Constitution and Declaration of Independence talks about. It meant that they had to create on their own a sense of identity and value through the music. Because at least through the music, you could describe a world that may not exist, but at least you could describe what it would look like if it did. Um, me and my brother Eugene, we grew up in Jacksonville, Florida, um, not too far from here. My mom, she lost her sight at age 16 or so. So I would consider her my first mentor. And right now, I, I, we, we, we lost my dad in 2002, and she's been living alone since that time. And I mean, she cooks and cleans, and you know what I mean? If you went to her house, she'd tell you to sit down, and she'd take care of everything. Um, so she didn't permit any kind of sense of self-pity at all. She wasn't going for it. So both my folks, I mean, we, we went through a lot of difficult times. My, my dad, he got up every day and went to work. He was a longshoreman. He got up every single day, 5 o'clock in the morning, to go out and work. So I didn't see people who considered themselves victims. And they simply wanted a better life for me and Eugene. Now, I really don't remember losing my sight, but my mother says that it was, a, you know, it was an extremely traumatic thing. I mean, I honestly can't even tell you anything I looked at when I could see, okay? So it was a, you know, even now it's kind of a hard thing to think about. But she understood exactly what I was going through, so she never let me feel sorry for myself. And she, she saw to it, she didn't get a chance to go to a school and learn Braille and, you know, a lot of the things that were available to some people when, when she came up, 
So she saw to it that I did. So I remember learning Braille, uh, I was maybe six, six and a half, and, and I do remember thinking to myself, I'd better hook this up, or I'm gonna be left out. I don't know how I knew, it was kind of intuitive. Um, so I learned it in about three weeks, I don't know, four weeks, I mean, I worked on it like every, every day when I got home from school. Uh, and at 10, I went away to the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind. And though the instruction was great and you know the staff was great, but it was real difficult to leave your family. I mean, that's, that's a hard thing. Anybody who's been to a state school uh, and, and uh, integrated into that residential life uh, will tell you, you know, it's a difficult transition because that's when you're really confronted with your disability in a way that's hard to explain to folks because you have to recreate familiarity. Um, and you're dealing with people that you don't really know. And so a lot of the power that you have when you're in a known familiar environment is gone. Now I have to say when I was a child, um, I didn't let my interest in music affect just being like a regular kid. So I remember doing a lot of regular, you know, regular stuff, having fun. Like we, we had a basketball court about maybe half a block from my house. And I remember we'd roller skate on this basketball court and I would just follow the sound of the other kids skating and I'd follow them and it was insane because I mean there, you know, there are poles and all kind of stuff you can run into. So I do remember being knocked almost unconscious when I ran into one and I just got up and kind of dusted it off and, and, uh, and kept going. So I guess I would say that I've always had like a real determined spirit to be included in things. Like I wasn't gonna let the disability get in my way. Um, I loved baseball and football when I was a kid. So I used to listen to baseball on the radio. There were a lot of hip radio shows like the CBS Radio Mystery Theater. I used to listen to that. We we're supposed to be asleep at 8.30, but we'd all sneak and stay up with a little radio and listen to it at about between nine and 10. Um, and I loved, like, I don't know, for some reason, I was obsessed with playing Monopoly. Like, I guarantee you, I think I could win that tournament if I entered it. <laughs> Me and my family, we used to play, like, we used to keep records. Like, you know, oh, I'm 132, and you're, uh, you're only 80 and 50, you know, so it, it was kind of crazy. Uh, so I think it's real important for children with disabilities, regardless of type, they need to have fun. They need to laugh and cry like other kids. But most of all, they have to navigate the difficult challenges associated with being disabled while feeling physically and emotionally secure. So even though we were poor, we didn't have a whole lot of money, but I always felt safe in those early years of blindness as long as my parents and my brother were around. And then other people as I got to know them. Um, now I started off playing piano in church. That was really the first exposure to music that I had, that and like the radio. Um, and I always remember, my mother used to always say, you know, when she'd hear me play, the most important thing when you play is for you to communicate a feeling to people that they get. So if I played something, her attitude was, well, you're going to keep playing it until I feel something, okay? <laughs> and, so, and so I remember to this day, that's, you know, that's what I try to do. And, and no matter how complex technically what we choose to play in music, any type of communication is about trying to establish an empathetic relationship with your audience so that they get a sense that you feel what they feel. So that, you know, you're not talking down to them, you, you're, you're, you're communicating with them. And that's, a, that's an essential component to me of moving people or getting them to see your point of view without just using traditional rhetoric, which is where we try to persuade somebody to think something just through argument or logic. Because a lot of times, the other, pe the other person has lo logic and argument too, so you just go back and forth. It's like these political contests, you know what I'm saying? Like, so each person just gives their position and they push you into it. Well, fortunately, art doesn't do that. We try to find empathy through a shared experience that we can express through the music that we play. Now at the Florida School for the Blind, I was sent there specifically to study music, but like most kids, I, I, 
I didn't do what my parents told me to do. I mean, they weren't there, so I figured I could get away with not doing what I was told. And uh, they told my folks, well, you know, he's really not practicing or, or doing what he can. Boy, I'll, I'll never forget that experience, boy. Then when they got through with me, I, I did at least start practicing. <laughs> and I remember my, my first piano teacher, Hubert Foster, who was like a fantastic teacher. He was a great pianist. I mean, he could, he, he could take that Steinway piano you see over there and take it apart and put it back together. And he was totally mine, just like me. He knew how to tune. He knew how to build them, reconstruct them. He had a graduate degree in voice. I mean, he was a brilliant guy. Um, so he told me when I was like maybe 12 or 13, he said, look, you, you know, you're going to have to learn how to read broad music. I was like, well, why do I got to do that? He said, because you don't want to be illiterate. OK? He said, if you can read, then you now have access to all of the music that sighted musicians have. But man, it was hard, though. Like the, like the staff is laid out in a real logical fashion. Like if you can see a, a, a staff, treble or bass clef, it, Alto or Turner Clef, I mean, it's, there's a logic to it that visually makes sense. Well, Braille music is based on the same literary code that literature is used, so everything means something different. So it's very complicated. And to make it worse, there are three different types of Braille notation. And um, he made me learn all three. But what I used to do at first is I'd tear up the music and pretend I lost it. So <laughs> <laughs> I could kind of avoid learning how to do it. But he finally just made it clear, like, well, if you don't do this, I'm not going to teach you. So. I got over that, and I'm so grateful to him to this day that he made me do that. I had a lot of interests musically. I used to play saxophone and, and drums when I was a kid. Matter of fact, I'm, I'm actually on a Wynton Marsalis record on one tune playing alto saxophone because he wanted musicians who really couldn't play their instrument to symbolize a certain kind of naturalness. So, uh, yeah, I know. Yeah. He, he. <laughs> So if you ever, uh, there's a record called Uptown Ruler, and if you ever listen to Psalm 26, that's me playing alto saxophone on that, but uh, I don't know that you necessarily want to check that out. <laughs> uh, I wanted to learn how to play at a high level, but like I said, we didn't really have access to special schools. You know, I was blessed to have the teachers that I, you know, that I did have, but it was definitely difficult. I think that's why to this day I, I just have an affinity for the underdog. Like I've always hired musicians that nobody else really wanted. You know, kids who basically weren't the most talented, they weren't necessarily sought after. You know, there's something about an affinity for that. I mean, I was, you know, I've, I've always rooted for the underdog. Uh, you know, even if they didn't have the best training or exposure to great music, in art. When I left high school, I went to Florida State University and I studied with a great teacher, Leonidas Lipovetsky. And the first thing he told me when I came in for a lesson is that I was going to have to start over because my technique was all wrong. I was like, what? I came in there thinking I had it all figured out. <laughs> and so I fought him for almost a year, but I finally succumbed to what he said and he taught me a whole lot about sound production, and I remember one, one lesson I came in with the uh, Beethoven Sonata called The Tempest, and I remember we worked on the first four measures for like half an hour, and uh, he kept stopping me after I played two or three notes. He says, no, this is not possible. <laughs> and, <laughs> boy, I was mad. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that's the thing you got to understand. Like, any, any field that you choose, I mean, there are difficulties with it, the problem with my job, like if you're a musician or, or your job is public, well, everything that you do, people are watching it. So you can't go into an office and screw up and only you know try to hide it from people. But it's a job where if you make a mistake, everybody sees it, thousands of people. Um, I left college when I was 21 to go on tour with Wynton Marcellus. That was 1985. And there's a loss of security that goes with being on the road. You know what I mean? Because I was used to, like Florida State, I could get around. I knew where everything was. You know what I mean? It, it was, I wasn't the most mobile person, but I, you know, I spent four years there and was very comfortable. Now all of a sudden I'm on the road. We're in different hotels every day. So you really don't know where nothing is. So I think that introduced a level of, um, 
a, you know, lack of security that even to this day, I mean, it's kind of there. Because I, I was just used to getting up and going when I felt like it, going where I felt like it, you know what I mean? So to have that sort of taken away kind of brought the disability into more focus. And the other thing, back then, like now you can see, um, reading notes that, that I was able to write down with this Braille Sense YouTube. That didn't exist back then. I used to go on the road with big, huge Braille volumes of music and stuff. Man, it stuff was heavy, it was bulky, it looked crazy. And I had to memorize everything. So people's phone numbers, you know, you're trying to run a business without the ability to really look at your records. So it was, it was I gotta tell you, I mean, it was difficult. So I think technology has played a huge role in evening the, you know, the playing field for uh, disabled people. Because one of our issues, like if you, if you eat a lot of blind people, I'll tell you, we're, we're like, uh, like, like you know people who grow up and uh, they're starving, like they never got enough food, and then they finally get some money and some food, man, they, they eat everything in sight. It doesn't matter if it's good or not, they just want to check it out. Let me have some of that. Um, and we're kind of similar. So, you know, you'll see blind folks who every type of technology, and I was no different, let me check that out. Well, we don't know if it works, but that's okay, let me see. Uh, and I think it just comes from when you're deprived of that. The uncertainty that goes with that compels you to just want to be included, okay? It's like a major issue. And, and you know, it's, it's positive and negative. Uh, now, in 1987, I entered the first uh, Thelonious Monk piano competition, and that was, that was mainly because I've always loved Monk's music. Uh, Thelonious Monk was a, was a genius of everything. He also struggled a lot in his career. He dealt with a lot of racism, had a lot of issues, and ironically enough, from 1947 to 1957, they took away his uh, cabaret card, which is how you worked in New York City at the time. So he'd have, he'd have to go to clubs and hear people play his music and mess it up, and he couldn't even get those gigs. So um, he's a real symbol of being relentless until you finally get where you want to go, which he finally did. He was on the cover of Time in 1964. So I did win that competition, and you know there was like a record contract or something associated with it. So I did my first record date as a leader a year later, and I was fortunate to be able to hire went in to play on it, and um, the great Elvin Jones, who played with John Coltrane, and Charlie Rouse, who, who, who played with Monk. And I remember I was so nervous when I walked in there the first day, and, and Elvin Jones, who was a very, very intimidating figure, great drummer, and uh, I walked in the studio, and he says, what do you want me to do, he says to me. I was like, uh. I was, you know, just real timid and kind of bad. I, you know, I was like, well, sir, I'd like to. He says, look, if you're going to lead, lead. So tell me what you want. So it was a big lesson in uh, learning how to be in a leadership position but still have a certain amount of grace and dignity, dignity to allow other people to be who they need to be. That's, that's one of the great lessons of jazz music. Like when you play in a jazz band, you have the ability to be an individual and to celebrate your identity, but you have to do it through a shared struggle with all the other musicians on the bandstand. Which means that you have to make compromises that they don't really, it's more important that the music is elevated than each individual person. So your elevation really comes through your ability to be understanding and empathetic to the other people who are on stage. Now back in the 80s, a lot of musicians didn't re really want to play jazz music. So our question at that time was more like, are we really going to be able to learn how to play this music properly? It wasn't so much like, are we going to get a lot of people to do it? Um, and even when I went on the road with Winton, the truth of it is, he hired me honestly more out of desperation. Like there was literally, like, there was literally no one else for him to contact to play piano in his band. Like when his pianist, Kenny Kirkland, left, um, to go play with Sting, I, I honestly don't think he had an option. So he called me more on a whim and said, well, you know, we'll try him out. I got to his apartment, and we were rehearsing one of his tunes. I uh, can't remember which one it was. It might have been Black Coast from the Underground, but it was you know, one of his tunes. And you know, I was messing up the rhythm. 
Now, this is how ignorant people are about disabilities, even somebody as sophisticated as him. So I remember he stopped me, he goes, man, you're screwing up the rhythm. He goes, man, maybe that's because you're blind. He says, well, no, that doesn't make sense. Stevie has good rhythm, so that must not be it. I said, no, that's <laughs> not it. I said, I'm just screwing it up. Give me a minute, I'll get it. <laughs> And so for the first time since I lost my sight, I kind of felt the loss of fundamental safety and security, man, because I didn't know him. I was kind of crazy when I think back when I went on the road with people. I didn't know who they were, nothing about them. <laughs> and if you think of all, the, all of the stuff you hear about musicians out on the road, you know what I mean. I, but I wanted to play so bad, I didn't really care. And I really hated being in a situation where I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So when I got that opportunity, I took it, even though it meant I had to rely on other people uh, more than I felt like it. Now there was a great philosopher from France, Alexis de Tocqueville, and he wrote that Americans suffer from what he called an obsession with autonomy. That is what de Tocqueville identified here. It comes from a concept of democracy as freedom, as freedom alone, but it is freedom negatively defined. People think we are free when we don't depend on and are not dependent upon by others. We are free when we have no responsibility to others. That freedom comes at the cost of the alienation and selfishness Tocqueville described. We are confined to solitude of our own hearts. And so again, when you have a disability, that's really your struggle because a disability kind of confines you into a solitary, a solitary state. And so it takes a whole lot of effort and a whole lot of ingenuity and a whole lot of self-determination for you to conquer that and find a way to force people in an elegant way to include you in things. And when people have that shared feeling, when they can see from your point of view what's going on, they're empathetic. Now what I learned in those early years of being in Winton's bed is that everyone has a different set of insecurities. So a lot of them were discouraged and ready to quit. I remember when I first met him, he, he actually was gonna quit playing. I was like, what? You got all these Grammys and all this stuff, you gonna quit, come on, man. I said, well, at least give it six months. Give me a chance to learn how to play before you quit, if you do decide to do it. And often, you know, they'd come to me for advice and support. So I learned that disability is a universal problem. Just like some disabilities, like skin color, are more apparent than others. I've often thought that the discrimination that is associated with disabilities is really a result of both a lack of understanding and fear. At the core, we all wonder when we see someone different or someone who is struggling whether we could cope with that particular challenge. And so it's important that we teach people that yes, they can. Like Helen Keller did. I mean, to me, I mean, if you were gonna, if you were gonna talk about somebody who really represented uh, strength under adversity, if you were going to list the top ten, I mean, she'd probably be number one. Because she gave us a whole different view of how an impossible situation could actually not only become possible, but that you could become a leader in a world of people who, who are not living through what you're living through. So the years I worked with Winton, we did several recordings. J Mood was the first one that we did, and we did a record called Standard Time, Volume One, and Live at Blues Alley, a bunch of things. The first record that I did as a band leader was called The Truth Is Spoken Here. That was the one where I hired Elvin and all those folks. And I've done, I don't know, maybe 20 records since then. Um, now, to quote Norhouse again, he said, whoever is moved by music to the depths of his soul, and works on his instrument like one possessed, who loves music and his instrument with passion, will acquire virtu virtuoso technique. He will be able to recreate the artistic image of the, comp of the composition. He will be a performer. Now, in 1996, after putting together various bands and doing all kinds of things I won't bore you with right now, I was fortunate to meet the great conductor, Seiji Ozawa, who conducted the Boston Symphony Orchestra um, <clears throat> for 29 years. And it's a very special relationship because a conductor's job 
he instructs the orchestra through his baton to phrase the music properly. And so they all look at him to know what they should do. Well, both he and I took a big chance because I'm a jazz guy and I'm blind and he's a classical guy and he's conducting people and he's expecting people to look at him. So there's a certain amount of trust that's going on here. <laughs> and uh, I remember the first time we worked with him, we were doing the I Got Rhythm Variations and uh, there's like, there was a cue going on and he go, and, and, and I remember we were playing the stuff differently every time. He says, uh, I cannot follow your cue. Uh, orchestra will not know when to come in. I said, oh. I said, well. So we played exactly the same thing every time. And he was real nervous about it, and I was too. Because I didn't necessarily know exactly what he was going to do. So that relationship, that relationship taught me a lot about a basic rule that I tell all disabled people that I meet. The one thing you want to do, if you want to get hired out here, or if you want people to deal with you, is you better figure out a way to make it easy for people to deal with you. That's a real important thing. If you can make it easy and comfortable, then people will get over their own fears because they really don't know what to do. So figuring out a way to make that work with him now we're at a point where when I work with Seiji, it's very, very comfortable. He's laughing and joking. He, he doesn't care because he knows that he knows how we're going to do things. I know how he's going to do things. So that relationship finally has resulted in, you know, he commissioned me to write a piano concerto uh, for his orchestra in Japan, which I'm working on right now, feverishly. I got about six weeks to get it done. Um, and we'll premiere it in Japan in, in, in September. So. Uh, He's been responsible for a lot of the opportunities that I've had to bring jazz and classical music together. Uh, so in addition to Rhapsody in Blue, he encouraged me for years and years to do an arrangement of Gershwin's Concerto in F, which I finally did, and we premiered in 2003, and we did a recording of it in 2005 and performed it with the Berlin Philharmonic in 2003. And in 2003, when we went to Berlin to do this, the orchestra really was not interested in playing Gershwin. I mean, they have a great tradition going back to Wagner. I mean, they're, you know, it's a great German orchestra. And they were kind of looking at this American stuff as, are you kidding? I mean, do we really have to play this right now? And so the first rehearsal, I got to tell you, it was awful. And we really couldn't <laughs> communicate with them. And uh, Seiji was not happy with it. And I remember we walked off stage, and he simply said, they don't think there's music here, we will see. And we came back the next day, and he'd gotten up and he'd studied that score for six or seven hours, and he's got a photographic memory to begin with. And I remember he came in, he dismissed my trio, he says, we don't need you right now, we will call you. And I watched him rehearse that orchestra measure by measure, uh, playing American in Paris. And believe me, when he got through with them, they couldn't wait to play concerto in F. <laughs> so the final thing I want to talk about is mentoring. You know, I mentioned earlier, like Seiji was a mentor to me. Uh, Wynton Marcella certainly was, my mom, you know, a lot, of, a lot of folks. But mentoring other musicians is probably the theme of my life. And, and maybe, maybe I received that from my peers at FSDB, many of whom had far less training or native talent than I. And so I started teaching at Florida State in 2004, and I started meeting some of the young people who wanted to play jazz music, and I, I just started to work with them. The first kid was a young fellow named Alfonso Horn, very talented trumpet player. Uh, he was really the foundation of what eventually became a band that I call the Modern Jazz Generation. And that band is dedicated to giving young people an opportunity to play who in normal circumstances probably wouldn't get to play. So that's become a very important cause. Uh, and now we have a lot of musicians who want to play. Um, 
it's a very, very important thing for me uh, when I see that. It means that in these 30 years, what I told you initially, when people who really didn't want to play this music, now they do. So in closing, I'll read you a quote from Albert Murray, who kind of summed it up. He wrote a great, great book called Stomping the Blues. And he says, also always absolutely inseparable from all such predicaments and requirements is the most fundamental of all existential imperatives, affirmation, which is to say, reaffirmation and continuity in the face of adversity. Indeed, what with the blues, whether known by that or any, any other name, always somewhere either in the foreground or the background, reaffirmation is precisely the contingency upon which the very survival of man as human being, however normally unsatisfied and abnormally wretched, is predicated. And that's what we're dealing with with any disability, is we have to have a sense of reaffirmation in the, in the face of adversity. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to play a quick tune for you, because I think we've kind of run out of time here. And uh, that's thanks to technology. i got a Braille watch, so I, I know that I've, I'm talking too long now. <laughs> so I'm going to play a uh, quick piece for you by W.C. Handy called the St. Louis Blues. Thank you all very much.
Wow. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you. And thank you for those wonderful words of inspiration. I, I think they have something to say to, to all of us. Thank you so much.